Okay, I want to talk about a study we did back in 2017 on some smoke-tainted Pinot Noir. This is a picture of the Columbia Gorge fire uh, in 2017, and hopefully we don't have to repeat this again going forward, but there was definitely a lot of smoke around in 2017, and uh, these grapes were from a, a vineyard that's in very close proximity to these. So we wanted to, we got an opportunity to work with some fruit. So let's talk about what we did with, in this uh, trial. So this is Columbia Gorge Pinot Noir. Uh, it was donated from a particular grower, and uh, they suggested that we take it because there was a, uh, a winery in town that rejected it because it had all the precursors uh, for smoke taint in it. So we went ahead and uh, tried this out. Now, going back to 2017, the state of smoke taint research was very different than it is today. So we have a lot of other compounds we're looking at, and the the Technologies evolved very dramatically in the last few years um, to really look further into this phenomenon. And so um, I'm not going to pick any battles here, but we did uh, use ETS's uh, glycol and methyl glycol analysis, which was pretty much the best in the world at that point in time. And now we're seeing them continually evolve with uh, some some sniff MR uh, technology. It's going to be really exciting to see where that goes. But uh, so a little bit backwards in time, but I think it's very important to see how different treatments worked on these particular compounds. So uh, in, in uh, this was a duplicate trial. We did uh, basically multiple uh, macerations and uh, we tried different ways of approaching it. So one way we did it was we made one into rosé. We brought it right in, we pressed it right away, got it off the skins. Then we did a standard maceration seven days on skins. Then we did an extended maceration for 22 days. And then we did a real true carbonic maceration where we hand laid the fruit into barrels uh, layered with CO2, and then uh, put a heater underneath uh, in a, a tarp over the top, put a heater on it, and held it at 30 degrees centigrade, and then pressed and fermented it uh, afterwards. And the goal was to see how different maceration strategies, uh, concentration of glycol and formethyl glycol during fermentation and subsequent aging. So I do have to do a little disclaimer here. Uh, the wines that were made in this are from induplicate trials, made at a production level. This is not going to be published in an academic journal. I am not attempting to step on anybody's toes in terms of smoke taint research, where it's at, anything like that. We're just going to report what our trials showed. Uh, this study is representative of one year with one variety of grape, with one set of very specific fire conditions. Uh, it's been shown that the substrate of the fire has a dramatic impact on the ability of a grape to have or exhibit a smoke uh, taint. So whether it's, uh, you know, Australian eucalyptus or uh, pine trees or grass fires, they all have very different makeup of uh, in their smoke. And then varieties themselves also uh, can pick up smoke taint at different levels. And it seems that like the canary in the coal mine, according to Eric Herbe, is uh, Petit Verdot. It's very easy at, at uh, absorbing these compounds. Then the vine processes them and then drops them into the fruit. And we can't really tell in the fruit if there's an issue. The fruit tastes fine. Most of these compounds are glycosylated. They're, st they're stuck to a sugar, and it isn't until fermentation happens and all the enzymes that yeast produce start to release these things. And we, we do know from, from trials, um, the, it just from around the valley and experience, that we've had a couple of different winemakers have uh, come in with, uh, we had, for instance, we had Cabernet, two different winemakers brought to the same crush, crush facility on the same day. And one winemaker's wine exhibited smoke taint quite impressively and the other one didn't at all and my ask was immediately did one winemaker use enzyme at the crusher and the answer was yes one did and one did it and that maceration enzyme it started this breakdown process now the other thing to be aware of is that even in micro fermentations and things like that initially um, some of these things don't show up and the enzymatic properties of any particular wine change over time and uh, these compounds can pop off later so I've seen wines that, you know, were quote unquote, going to be fixed. They fixed them, flat out fixed them. You know, we did ultra filtration. We did, you know, carbon fining. We did all these other things to get rid of these compounds. And then wine got bottled. And then two years later, boom, uh, it popped back up again. So uh, it's a pretty tricky uh, uh, set of circumstances. So uh, anyway, I just want to point that out that it's always going to be different. Your results are going to vary. So just take this with a grain of salt. And, uh, you know, don't try it at home. Don't intentionally smoke your grapes unless you've got a grant funding to, to do that. Okay, I want to do a graphical representation of what we did here. Um, we had identical barrels across the board. 
And what we went ahead and did is we did a rosé that we pressed straight. We did regular maceration, extended maceration, carbonic maceration. We used EC triple one eight because it's fairly neutral yeast. It's very reliable, and its fermentation kinetics are very well known. So it was just something that uh, we figured is a pretty industry standard yeast. So we went ahead and used it, so it wouldn't kind of kick off anything that we would see that would be unusual. So here's the uh, incoming fruit, and uh, here's what it looked like. We had uh, twenty five bricks, so it's pretty ripe. Uh, in terms of Pinot Noir, pH is pretty low, um, acids are in a pretty good place, uh, and uh, the N was a little low, so obviously we had to add some, but looking at the, the Guayacol number, we saw uh, point, uh, 1.6, and that number tends to be high enough uh, that that indicates that it's had some smoke exposure. So this is the wine chemistry after one year. So we saw some differences in numbers here, but I wanted to note one thing in particular, the rosé, we did water back because we felt like it might be something that we could um, potentially sell um, and uh, use. And we were also open the regular as well, but that didn't turn out to be the case. The, the, the smoke uh, compounds became pretty pronounced um, in these wines as time went on. But the rosé was quite good and we did in fact uh, sell it. So um, it, it ended up being quite good. So we'll talk about that as we move on. Um, and uh, then we didn't water back some of the other treatments. Um, and the carbonic, we didn't water back, but it does appear that um, we just pressed it so lightly that the uh, ethanol content was down a little bit. So uh, very interesting to see the acid change too that does occur through that you know acid respiration that occurs in carbonic maceration. So uh, pretty interesting. Uh, so let's go ahead and go through the smoke compounds as of December 2017. So this is a few months after we had uh, made the wine. So after we pressed it, we uh, took a look at the rosé, and this is uh, a finished wine concentration. And um, not much there, uh, definitely well below threshold. Uh, depending on who you talk to, threshold somewhere between 10 and 30 nanograms a liter of glycol. And methyl glycol actually has a higher uh, threshold, uh, maybe uh, uh, you know in the uh, 10 to, to 30, 40 part range. So um, uh, you know not much there to see. Uh, regular maceration, uh, a little bit more glycol, not a whole lot, still kind of technically below threshold. But remember, we're only looking at two compounds. There's, you know, creosol and syringol and all these other uh, uh, compounds that we've kind of now alludicated on. So again, you know, the, the state of uh, smoke research has advanced quite dramatically in just uh, three years. So pretty interesting. And then here we get to the extended maceration. We see more glycol. This is, again, December. Um, and uh, uh, there's definitely an increase in length of time. And then the carbonic, we were pretty surprised because we figured that this might be an opportunity to end up with a lower amounts of these compounds. But what was really interesting about this is this doesn't tell the story really um, because the carbonic maceration, although the numbers don't show uh, in this case that these, these compounds were pretty low, uh, this wine is definitely got the most uh, intense smoky aroma. So uh, there are, you know, hundreds of potential smoke aroma markers. So these two maybe just didn't show the whole picture. Um, and that idea that some of these things are glycosylated and pop off, um, I think when you did the sensory on the wine, definitely showed a much more significant impact than you would think uh, bared out on the numbers. And then we look at the glycol to methyl glycol ratio, and this can tell us a little bit about the nature of the fire, but in this, this particular case, uh, the ratios are uh, uh, definitely more substantial the longer you leave things on skins. Um, and the other thing we wanna talk about too in this particular case is uh, I'll uh, post up some links uh, to ETS Labs so you can read up a little bit more on what these things mean. So um, as of January, 2018, uh, we did some sensory analysis and we, uh, as a class, said the rosé is actually pretty decent. Uh, the extended maceration is the least offensive of the bu uh, bunch. There's enough other stuff going on to sort of mask the smokiness. Uh, the regular is not right. Uh, something's just not right. It's not Pinot Noir, it's just not right. Um, and then the carbonic maceration is the weirdest smelling wine ever. It was like bacon and bubble gum and barnyard had a baby. Uh, it, it smelled like Britannomyces. It did not have Britannomyces in it. Uh, it had smokiness and bacon, and then it had all the bubble gummy aromas of uh, carbonic maceration. It was just honestly one of the weirdest wines I've ever had in my entire life. And so we tested at the kind of end of December, early January. So uh, I want to kind of do a temporal uh, look at how these wines changed uh, over time. So we can see in the rosé in this particular instance, the, uh, this is where we were at end of December, early January, pretty low uh, numbers. And then uh, as time went on, 
we saw this pop in uh, the uh, amount of the, the glycol concentrations. Again, still low, not enough to really think too much about, worry too much about, but we definitely saw a uh, market increase in uh, these concentrations. And this is just that idea that there are things still continuing to go on in wine um, in the enzymatic state of the wine changes. And uh, as these glycosylated compounds release, uh, they can increase over time. This rosé was sold commercially. Everybody loved it, well below threshold. So uh, we didn't see any of those other compounds. Uh, we didn't know about them at the time, but uh, affecting the wine. So it was just a lovely uh, summer rosé, beautiful wine. Then let's look at the regular maceration, again, going back to January and December. And uh, we see the numbers are a little bit higher. It's, you know, we leave it on skins a little bit longer, it pops up. But then let's take a look at it in July. And we see, again, a market increase in both of these compounds and that idea that the enzymatic state of the wine is changing and we, we have an increase in July. And so by the time we got to this in July, this wine was uh, certainly not going to be uh, saleable, even though the, the markers here didn't tell the whole story. Uh, the sensory analysis was, was much more pronounced than the, the analysis showed. And again, the extended maceration in January, and then we'll move on to July and we see a big pop. And uh, the extended maceration, uh, again, we're showing this uh, increase over time. This is just one year down the road, and uh, six months down the road, and a uh, pronounced difference in the wine. And again, this doesn't tell the whole story. The wine definitely had an ashiness, a smokiness uh, to it that was, was quite pronounced. Uh, so pretty interesting and uh, to see that, that happen. And then our carbonic maceration in January uh, had a little bit more, and then again, an evolution of uh, the carbonic maceration to see an increase. But the carbonic, again, not telling the whole story. These numbers are showing these two compounds below threshold. I assure you, this wine was uh, very, very uh, smoke affected. And again, that glycol to methyl glycol ratio. And the carbonic and rosé are pretty similar uh, in that, right? But uh, definitely sees how that carbonic maceration has a, a bigger effect on uh, enhancing methyl glycol, particularly, uh, than uh, over glycol. And that's just a different change in the enzymatic state of the wine. And then July, we see a, a change again, where uh, the, the, the carbonic seems to increase. And we have, a, again, a, a, a change in that ratio. So some takeaways. <clears throat> Don't pick Pinot Noir at 25 bricks. That would be my first uh, advice. Uh, length of maceration when looking at the regular in this state is directly correlated to both glycol and methyl glycol. So uh, the longer you leave it on skins, the more of these compounds you get. Um, you know, knowing what we know now, I'd love to take these wines, uh, have bottled these and t test for smoke taint now three da years down the road to see uh, the other compounds that are in there and just how affected they are. Um, and uh, the suspect compounds evolved in all treatments. And if you su suspect smoke tank, carbonic maceration may not be the best idea. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea, but it was certainly not a uh, really lovely wine. And again, the rosé turned out commercially viable, blended, and used for sale. Uh, the other treatments were deemed below commercially viable, and uh, we used to make brandy out of them. So I'll kind of finish up with, uh, anybody need some brandy? Let me know. Got a few hundred gallons of it now. Uh, and we also have to do a big thanks and shout out to the vineyard that, uh, that had, you know, unfortunately got hammered by the smoke uh, and had, you know, was forced to donate their fruit. So thank you. Uh, I also want to say a shout out to the people that made this happen. Uh, Maddie Myers, uh, Kelsey to Mary, Rich Kobe, Crystal Campling, uh, Brandon Kennedy, Scott McLean, and Tyler Rosenfeld were the ones that threw in to uh, make this happen. And of course, ETS Labs for providing all of the analysis. So cool. Thanks.